Today, we're going to talk about a new way to avoid the conclusion of Pascal's wager, as well as a way of remodeling the wager. But first, here's Pascal's wager in a nutshell. Rational people perform actions that lead to good outcomes. However, life has uncertainty, so we usually need to act not off the goodness or utility of an action's outcome, but by the expected utility of an action, which is found by multiplying the goodness of an outcome by the probability of getting that outcome. So an action which leads to $100 50% of the time has an expected utility of $50. So the expected utility of becoming a Christian is the infinite reward of going to heaven multiplied by the probability of Christianity's truth. Now, infinity has this cool absorption property, where if you multiply it by a real positive number, you get infinity. So the expected utility of Christianity is still infinity, so long as Christianity's probability is above zero. That's a super huge motivation towards being a Christian. Before we get to the new objection I came up with, we're going to look at two other objections, starting with a really old one, the many gods objection. Sure, Christianity has infinite expected utility, but so does Islam, Odinism, Zoroastrianism, and so on, because all those religions promise some sort of infinite reward for adherence. So how do we pick between them? Well, that's not very hard. Say you have a bunch of doors, where you can only open one, and each has a chance at having an infinite reward behind it, but the chance that they will have this infinite reward is different for each door. Which door do you open? Obviously the one with the highest probability of having an infinite reward behind it. So with the many gods objection, just figure out which religion has the highest chance at giving you the infinite utility and go with that one. That is to say, find the religion which has the highest probability of being true and go with it. Now, a newer objection is that set theory shows us that there are different sizes of infinity. Different infinities are written out like this. We have the Hebrew letter Aleph, and then a subscript. Aleph 0 is the smallest infinity, Aleph 1 is the next biggest, Aleph 2 is the next biggest, and so on. Each of these Aleph numbers, these different sized infinities, has that absorption property I mentioned earlier. And that's what's important for this objection. Say I do some amazing apologetics and convince you that Christianity has a 99% chance of giving you, say, Aleph 1 utility. Then someone else can just come along and make up a weird religion that promises Aleph 78 utility. Because that was just made up, it's going to have a way lower probability than Christianity. But that doesn't matter. Aleph 1 times 99% is still Aleph 1. And Aleph 78 times that small probability is still Aleph 78. So you should prefer this random made-up religion to Christianity. Now Liz Jackson responds to this argument by pointing out that we don't have much of a reason to think that the utility provided by Christianity is, well, our example, Aleph 1. Maybe it is, but maybe it's Aleph 79. We don't know. So we can't say that a given made-up religion is an actual challenger to Christianity, thus leaving it undefeated. Now, the newest objection, the one I came up with, builds off of that one. Let's make up an infinite number of religions, each promising a different infinite utility. Religion 0 promises Aleph 0 utility, Religion 1 promises Aleph 1 utility, and so on. The probabilities of these religions basically don't matter because the infinities will just absorb them. Now the promise of Religion 0 should annihilate any consideration of mere finite utility, because Aleph 0 obliterates the finite by being so much bigger. And religion 1 should annihilate any consideration of religion 0 because Aleph 1 obliterates alpha 0 by being so much bigger. And religion 2 should annihilate any consideration of religion 1 because Aleph 2 obliterates Aleph 1 by being so much bigger, and so on. We can, by this logic, conclude that for every religion n, we can ignore it because of the promise of religion n plus 1. It obliterates it. Let's read that first part again. You can ignore the promises of every religion n. Yep, it's totally rational to just ignore all these religions. So, that means though, if someone starts delivering Pascal's wager, you could just tune them out, because there's some bigger and better religion which will obliterate any consideration of their puny religion. And also ignore that bigger religion too, because there's a biggerer and betterer religion out there. And you could ignore that one too, and so on. This objection doesn't work for my personal application of the wager, since I think that for any Aleph N, Christianity is my best shot at getting Aleph N utility. So these made-up religions can't beat out Christianity. But still, that requires a super-specific distribution of probability assessments that you might not share. 
So this new objection is simply a possible way to dodge the wager, assuming that you don't make the same probability assessments as me. Anyways, I do have a response to this objection to Pascal's wager, but it involves giving Pascal's wager a makeover. To do this, we need to open up the vanilla wager and examine one of the cogs in it. See, implicit in the wager is the use of the better than relationship. Like, we go around saying that y is better than x, or y promises a higher expected utility than x, or something like that. This is similar to, but not identical to, the greater than relationship in math. With the greater than relation, we plug in numbers, and we end up with a statement which is either true or false. With the better than relationship, we plug in epistemically possible states of affairs. An epistemically possible state of affairs is basically just a way reality could possibly be as far as you know. So God existing is an epistemically possible state of affairs, God not existing is also an epistemically possible state of affairs, and basically anything you can imagine. You might find these improbable, and they might be actually impossible, but as far as you know, it's something that could be true. Oh, for this next part, we're going to limit our discussion to contexts with infinite utilities, then we don't need to worry about probabilities because then absorption takes over. Anyways, what we were basically doing with the last objection is stringing infinite epistemically possible states of affairs in an endless chain, so there was no best option for us. There was no option that we were obligated to pick. Let's get around this by defining a specific epistemically possible state of affairs, called the ultimate good. The ultimate good is, by definition, infinitely better than any other epistemically possible state of affairs and absorption also holds for the ultimate good. What does that mean? By way of analogy, the logic of Pascal's wager tells someone who thinks that, say, the state of affairs of achieving Aleph-1 utility is probably impossible or incoherent in reality, should still act on the chance that they're wrong because there's still some epistemic probability that Aleph-1 utility can be achieved. Now I'm coming along and asking, what if there's an ultimate, or maximum goodness, that can be achieved? Better than Aleph-0 utility, better than Aleph-1 utility, better than anything that's not itself the ultimate good. Besides saying that it's better than anything else which is even epistemically possible, I'm not going to define it with any more detail beyond that. Maybe you think that the ultimate good is impossible, and you even have arguments for that conclusion, but there's a chance that you're wrong and that your arguments don't actually work, so you should act on the off chance that you're wrong. That tidies things up for us quite a bit. Considerations of Aleph-0 utility obliterating considerations of finite utility. Considerations of Aleph-1 utility obliterate any considerations of Aleph-0 utility. And so on. While considerations of the ultimate good obliterate any considerations of anything which is not the ultimate good. So the job of a rational agent is to just search out that ultimate good. Using similar logic as earlier, if we're presented with multiple actions, each that has a probability of giving us the ultimate good, just choose the one that has the highest probability of bringing this about, and ignore every other consideration. Now, the best shot I could offer you at getting the ultimate good is the Christian doctrine of the beatific vision, where upon entering heaven, one is brought into a supernatural union with God, where you can directly perceive the supremely perfect God in all his glory and beauty and goodness. Don't mess around with anything else. Anyways, that's the end of this video. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe and support me on Patreon if you enjoy this content.